Okay. Thank you, everyone, um, for joining us here tonight. I just want to introduce myself. So my name is Pat Simons, and I'm the coordinator of the Yes to Renewables campaign at Friends of the Earth Melbourne. Um, we've got an awesome event tonight planned um, about Australia's opportunity in offshore wind. Uh, and you'll be hearing from a range of fantastic speakers um, covering, you know, perspectives in local government, uh, the unions, um, hearing from coal communities, as well as from experts in the climate movement. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, wherever we are, um, you know, we'll be calling in from all across the country. Um, you know, we're meeting on the lands of First Nations people. And I just want to pay respects to, um, you know, elders past and present. I'm calling in from Wurundjeri country in Nam, in Melbourne. And, you know, it's, it's great to see everyone sharing, you know, whereabouts um, they're calling in from and joining the conversation tonight in the chat and from and joining the conversation. just want to um, emphasise that, you know, the struggle for First Nations sovereignty is one that continues and we will continue to be in solidarity with that, that struggle into the future. So without further ado, I just want to, yeah, um, welcome everyone here tonight, interest the night. So we're, we're, we're coming together to talk about Australia's opportunity in offshore wind, which is an important new industry uh, when it comes to action on climate change. Um, Friends of the Earth um, first got interested in this, this sector um, about three or four years ago when the country's first major offshore wind farm, the Star of the South, was you know, made a major public announcement. Um, so that project um, is one that's been proposed um, in the Bass Strait in Gippsland, near the Latrobe Valley. And if it goes ahead, it has the potential to power up to 20% of the state and create thousands of jobs in the process. So we obviously looked at that and thought this is a really important opportunity for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, creating a pathway for workers in fossil fuel sectors to have new job opportunities and you know to, to create a new form of energy supply for the state. And since then, you know, we've been campaigning um, alongside, um, you know, local community members, allies in the union movement, climate strikers and others to see more progress on establishing this industry here in Australia. Um, we've had some important wins and we'll, we'll hear more about those tonight from some of our speakers. Um, but it's, it's important to recognise that um, this is, this is not the, the beginning. We've, we've been working on this for some time and um, it's great to have some of the people that have been important in the campaign of the last few years here with us tonight. So just to introduce um, the speakers uh, for the evening. Um, so first of all, we're going to be hearing from the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, New Italian Elms. Um, I'm very, very um, pleased to have New Italian joining us here tonight. So. Um, and then we're also going to be hearing from um, Tony Wolf, who is a coal power station worker at the Loyang, Loyang Coal Power Plant in the Latrobe Valley in Gippsland. We'll hear from Penny Howard, uh, who is a research officer at the Maritime Union of Australia and has been a really important voice in the campaign for offshore wind. And then we'll also hear from Tom Quinn, who's the head of policy and research at Beyond Zero Emissions, um, which is a climate policy think tank. So uh, after we hear from the speakers, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, feel free to chime in in the chat as, as we're listening to the speakers and keep the conversation going there. You can also join in on Twitter. Um, you can tag yes to renewables uh, and use the hashtags Oz Climate Solutions and Offshore Winds. Keep the conversation going there. Um, but yeah, please just enjoy the evening and um, we're going to hear from our speakers now. So I'll just introduce uh, the Lord Mayor first. And they do have an illustrious um, career for me, to, for me to talk about at length. So just give me a moment while I um, hit some praise on the Lord Mayor. Uh, so Lord Mayor New Atali Nelms um, has served for six years, uh, returned for a second um, consecutive term as the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, um, after the election in 2017 and previously served uh, as a councillor uh, for six years since 2008. Uh, New Atali holds a Bachelor of Business 
with a double major in industrial relations and human resource management and marketing from the University of Newcastle and is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the Harvard Bloomberg Leadership Initiative. During her time as counsellor, Natalia has worked on community climate adaptation programs with the United Workers Union, and Nuatali represents Newcastle on the Local Government for Sustainability Initiative with the Oceania Regional Executive Committee. Nuatali is the second woman to serve as the Lord Mayor of Newcastle since the 1970s, and we are very pleased to welcome her to speak tonight about Newcastle's opportunity in offshore wind. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the Lord Mayor and thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Pat, for that lovely introduction. I'm a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> I, um, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening and I uh, just wanted to let everyone know I'm coming to you uh, from Awabakal and Waramai lands and I pay my sincere respects to Elders past, present and emerging on all the lands um, we're meeting on. Uh, here this evening. This is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, without further ado, because we do have a, a fabulous lineup of people speaking tonight, uh, I'll just acknowledge the local work here of Glenn Williams uh, and the branch um, under his leadership of the MUA here in Newcastle and the Hunter and obviously working with Penny. And uh, at the City of Newcastle, we have uh, a good 20 year history on um, being leaders in uh, greenhouse gas emission or climate policy. And uh, we are currently doing a lot of work in the local government space with colleagues, uh, probably from everywhere where you're coming from as well, around the country in, with the Global Covenant of Mayors, as well as local governments for sustainability. So I have um, a, like a short uh, presentation, uh, which I thought might be a good way to display. So I'm going to share my screen uh, to, to help display uh, the information and where Newcastle and the Hunter is at. Uh, so hopefully that is sharing now. Is that correct? Have I been able to share that successfully, Pat? Yeah, I can see that, great. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, so the opportunity for offshore wind and our perspective, I thought just setting the scene, I'd let you know uh, where we've been at Newcastle. And like I said, 20 years, uh, we first developed our greenhouse action plan in 2001 in Newcastle. And our newest climate action plan uh, goes 21 to 25 and looks at how we can meet our own commitments at the city of Newcastle no later than 2030. Uh, for our own operations uh, reaching net zero admissions. So we've already looked at that across uh, four key themes in the city that's uh, already moving to 100% renewable energy supply, uh, zero admission transport from our own operations, and obviously best practice energy uh, uh, water and waste consumption and looking at how we can uh, reduce emissions through our own supply chains. So we've spent a lot of time looking at our own operations in, and being leaders in local government. Uh, this current climate action plan actually broadens that scope to work uh, more closely with industry and the community to try and accelerate action right across the city. And so we adopted a stretch net zero emissions target uh, of the, for the city no later than 2040. So looking at uh, that mix uh, that we believe of renewables is essential in achieving this target. And so that's why we see uh, the offshore wind opportunity as a very important and large role to play to achieve the goals, those stretch targets we've set, set for Newcastle by 2040. Those uh, renewable energy initiatives uh, that I did mention, uh, and you can see on the screen there, that long history is, uh, we're one of Australia's first green power schemes. We now operate our own five megawatt solar farm, uh, and we achieved 100% renewables for our own power supply in January 2020. Uh, with the first local government area uh, in New South Wales to do so. And that's through a purchase a power purchase agreement with the Sapphire Wind Farm in, uh, in the New England area. Complementing this, uh, for those of you not in New South Wales, Newcastle and the Hunter have also been nominated as a state renewable energy zone. So that's, that's a good thing. 
And just on Monday, we were also nominated uh, by the federal government as a hydrogen hub. So these are the, uh, there's a couple of features that really work for Newcastle and the Hunter region in terms of wind. And they're probably similar to uh, the, the Latrobe and, and other uh, highly skilled workforces throughout the country. Uh, it positions us to become hopefully a major international and national player in clean energy. So that's the very skilled workforce um, with thousands of workers that have been traditionally associated with the resource industry, uh, looking to be able to uh, transfer those jobs directly into uh, offshore wind, uh, if we can make it, uh, get that legislation through and make it viable. We also have the great uh, and, and exceptional, exceptional accessibility, uh, the Port of Newcastle, uh, and looking at how we can actually export green manufactured resources uh, like green steel and hydrogen from the port. So it couples in um, looking at the full opportunity that we have here in Newcastle and the Hunter, uh, looking at all the different types of renewable uh, energy to replace the current uh, uh, fossil fuel situation that we have. Uh, one of the other really uh, strong areas for us here is we have really good access to the national energy grid with the infrastructure that already exists. Uh, the Australian energy market operator has already um, noted that the Hunter offshore wind zone uh, would currently have the lowest cost to expand of any renewable zone in the national ele electricity market. So it really is um, of national significance. The proximity um, to offshore wind, if it could be uh, constructed uh, here in, in the, off the Newcastle and Hunter coast, uh, the, the access then back into the grid um, is very desirable. So just having a look at the, the projects that we currently know of, um, and there could be more, but what we know of here or I know of here in Newcastle is the uh, Newcastle Offshore Wind Energy Project. That proposal in its initial stages um, proposes a multi-stage 10 gigawatt wind farm located 20 kilometres off the Newcastle coastline, and that is actually capable of supplying a large portion of New South Wales energy requirements. There's also uh, uh, potential for OceanX who have looked at 1.8 gigawatt farms in that same area. So there are already a couple of uh, solid players in that, in that market in looking around uh, in this region, which I think is a good sign. And there's probably likely to be more. Uh, the offshore wind farms have been developed, obviously, as a lot of people would know, for over 30 years. And the benefits we're looking to for Newcastle would also be uh, easily extrapolated to the other sites that have been identified around the country, around energy and uh, economic development that have already been stated in New South Wales Electricity Infrastructure Roadmap, as well as their net zero plan and other related policies. Uh, also of, of great importance to us and uh, noted on this slide is the opportunity uh, for jobs. And at the end of the day, the more uh, jobs we can onshore in renewable energies, the better, better it's going to be, particularly the areas that have um, such uh, high skilled labour in either fossil fuels or traditional energy sources that we really need to work at protecting. And I just acknowledge again, the work um, of uh, the Hunter Jobs Alliance in that space, submissions by HunterNet as well, so Peak Body for Manufacturing, um, MUA and ETU are very cognizant uh, of this issue. And noting this, it's, we are already uh, a region that's in transition. It's already happening. Uh, those 10,000 jobs, um, both direct and inter indirect during these projects uh, would be during construction. And then you could look at depending on um, the size of uh, the potential wind farm, you'd look at you know, around 300 annual full-time operational jobs over 30 year, mainly uh, regional as well as high quality. Again, this, this type of uh, investment uh, in renewable sources uh, would go a long way into assisting transitioning workforces, uh, large scale innovation, new industry, uh, attract significant local and international investment 
So the other opportunities uh, we see here is that it accelerates innovation uh, in other related industries in hydrogen as well as electric transportation. When you get those innovation hubs and the, the, that skill set working together, and a lot of it exists in and around the Hunter at the moment, um, you can really look at how you can uh, spark that innovation and new ideas to meet the, the energy needs of the future through renewable sources. Uh, there's also a considerable amount of uh, benefit when you're looking at avoiding any of the environmental issues associated with land-based infrastructure and energy projects uh, in terms of offshore wind. Obviously, there's other environmental issues, but it can actually probably um, have a better environmental outcome uh, uh, from projects that already exist in Europe and the like than some of the projects that uh, can actually have a a significant environmental, environmental impact on shore. So for this, it's this is just sort of a bit of a snapshot um, for those who aren't local of what's happening in and around the Hunter region. So you can see that it's really clear that um, we are poised to take it, uh, advantage in this region of a transition to renewables and looking at how um, any new companies establishing themselves in this region don't miss out on the opportunity. You can see from sort of that mix on the screen there that there's already a significant amount of private sector investment in very large battery supply, uh, close to current grid networks here in the Hunter as well. So there's the, like I said, that the, the, our valley uh, and our region is already in transition and there's already private sector investment reflecting um, that movement. Uh, I think that we do need to look uh, at this offshore wind in terms of that really large opportunity in terms of renewable power supply. I just note that um, uh, particularly the MUA have been uh, fantastic in terms of their local advocacy with us and making sure that uh, you know, local government is particularly informed, you know, being very close to the community. Uh, when we go through looking at uh, our clean energy plans, our net zero plans, we do huge amounts of local community consultation and we have very, very uh, broad support across the city of Newcastle and our residents to make this happen. And I think that you can't uh, underestimate the power of community um, when we're looking at um, you know, getting the federal government to change legislation or write new legislation to actually allow these large scale renewables to, to happen. Uh, uh, Paddy Crumlin from the MUA has recognised um, a net zero emission renewable energy powered economy is necessarily, is really necessary to limit the worst impacts of not only climate change, but the development of an offshore wind industry would provide the opportunity for fossil fuel workers to do the important work of delivering Australia's renewable future. And I think that uh, that is exceptionally important uh, component for us here in the Hunter, um, that work around transition and that work around jobs. We also have a peak uh, body called HunterNet that represent all the manufacturers, manufacturing um, small, um, small, medium and large manufacturers in, in the region. A lot of them have been associated with the fossil fuel industry here for many years in the Hunter. They also have been uh, a lot of the think tanks for very innovative manufacturing solutions in that industry. And HunterNet have put a submission in uh, recently as well uh, supporting uh, offshore wind and uh, with their membership base that stretches through the region um, that a lot of them currently operating in fossil fuels really want to uh, see this transition and this legislation supported because they recognise that the existing supply chains, the legacy uh, energy infrastructure and the people that work in those supply chains uh, are extremely important uh, for the future of this region, but also that innovation already exists. And furthermore to um, manufacturing, you know, the next stage for me in thinking about it and uh, for the workers in this region and the opportunity we have in Australia is to actually look at how we can onshore um, the design, construction uh, and uh, the manufacture 
of the uh, obviously of the turbines and the equipment that we would need for this industry and then create um, tens of thousands of more jobs onshore in Australia. I think that uh, essentially we missed the boat 20 years ago with photovoltaics. Um, a lot of that IP was developed here in Australia and has gone offshore. And we do need to keep pushing um, our state and federal governments to move more quickly in addressing not only climate change, but also the economic and job opportunities that come with renewables. So that advocacy has been very uh, united in Newcastle. And I think it was really important for uh, me to, to share that opportunity uh, here with you uh, this evening as well. So that really concludes um, the, the, the main part of my presentation for this evening, but I'm really happy to uh, answer any questions. Uh, obviously my expertise is um, in Newcastle and the Hunter region, and I recognise we have you know, lots of people from uh, the, around Australia that are interested in this opportunity but I wanted to give you sort of a local on the ground, uh, local government look at this and just let you know that we do a lot of advocacy at a local government level uh, around uh, meeting uh, the Paris Climate Agreements and also leading up to Glasgow and COP26. And uh, together with uh, a lot of other mayors around the country, we have uh, looked at um, it's interesting if you don't um, operate in a local government level, if you look at the over 500 local governments in Australia and their collective um, either net zero or climate action plans, and you actually helped fund uh, local government at that level to implement those uh, plans or uh, those uh, uh, mitigation initiatives, you would actually achieve 97% of the current federal targets. So I think it's, it's really good to come at this from obviously a, a national perspective and that national advocacy, but also look at um, what can be done at a local level as well. So thanks for that opportunity, Pat. Thanks so much, Yilatali. That was a great presentation. And it's just really exciting to see, you know, the, the vision that the City of Newcastle has for this industry and the way that you're linking that to, um, you know, industry development, regional development, um, creating, you know, this long pipeline of jobs. So it's just really exciting to hear from you and, you know, about the work that's happening with unions and other groups as well. And I think that um, other regions will find that that, that level of collaboration really inspiring. So um, thank you so much for sharing that with us tonight. Um, and, you know, I guess hearing from, you know, one um, region that, you know, has is part of the, the coal uh, sector and the energy sector, you know, in its experience of transitioning to, to renewable energy, we're now gonna hear from Tony Wolf, who is um, a power plant operator at the Loyang um, coal-fired power station. Uh, in the Latrobe Valley in Gippsland. Um, in addition to working in the, the power, ind power industry, um, Tony is also a member of the Community Advisory Board for the Star of the South Offshore Wind Farm, which is, is likely to be the country's first offshore wind um, farm um, in Gippsland. Uh, he's also a board member of the Gippsland Climate Change Network. And um, yeah, it's just really exciting to have Tony here and hearing you know, the perspective um, from coal communities in Gippsland about this opportunity and offshore wind and what it means um, to fill the Trade Valley. So uh, thank you, Neil Tali. That was great. And let's hear from, from Tony. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, thanks for the intro. And I'd uh, just like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Gunai Kurnai country in uh, La Trobe Valley in, in Victoria and pay my respects to um, all the elders. Um, my brief was to talk about opportunities um, for offshore wind um, within La Trobe Valley and Gippsland, and I'm not sure whether any of you have noticed, but coal's closing down in Victoria, and and um, there's there's nothing being built to uh, replace it. We've we've in in recent years, uh, Mormal Power Station shut down, Hazelwood has closed, Yalorn is, um, has announced their closure. Uh, the newest coal fire power station in Victoria was built 30 years ago and um, with a life expectancy of 35 years. And 
there's nothing on the on the uh, on the ground or in the planning to replace um, the coal station. So it's imperative that we um, jump on board and try and um, uh, attach ourselves to what's going to replace that and be part of the solution rather than um, trying to hang on to it uh, as it's as it's closing down. Coal will still be a part of the mix for at least 10 years, but just in a much uh, diminishing capacity um, as, as renewables take over. So the opportunities that offshore wind presents and in particular um, Star of the South wind farm based in Gippsland. And, and I should preface this by saying that I'm not a spokesman for Star of the South. And, and so the views that I give are my own um, only, so I, I don't speak on behalf of the company that's um, that's proposing that. But um, a lot of people think that the Star of the South is much, much more advanced than where it is. The most common question we get asked is, "Well, when are you going to start building? Like, when, when's it going to um, when's it going to happen?" And and it's still in its infancy. That all the studies are being done, um, the marine studies, the bird studies, the um, uh, the on on land studies, uh, yeah, th there's there's 25 technical studies being done at the moment, which um, have to be checked off on, and the environmental impact statements, and and all of those things. So it's 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 a long way um, from a, a a done deal, if you like. Um, fantastic that the that the um, bill is finally before um, federal parliament to allow for offshore wind in. In Australia, and that's a, that's a fantastic step forward for the industry, um, and hope, and not only for Star and South, for, for industries right across Australia. There's there's quite a few uh, offshore wind uh, projects that are sitting in the waiting for this for this policy to get up there, because without it, um, nothing can happen. Um, so offshore wind has the potential to replace. Um, our coal dependence, um, but not by itself, obviously. So um, without storage capacity of some sort, um, offshore wind is, is, is not, it's, strictly speaking, it's not an attempt to, uh, to get rid of coal and, and replace it all with offshore wind because it'll be part of the mix, part of the energy mix, but not, not entirely, it, it, it won't be, um, viable to produce power for all of Australia with offshore wind unless we have the storage facilities as well. Um, a couple of things briefly about um, the Star of the South and the potential there um, is, as Nuatali mentioned, there's, there's a highly skilled workforce in La Trobe Valley um, that those jobs are are diminishing um, and and those skills are highly transferable um, to an offshore wind industry you, and and when when you say that yeah you, you might think that that's a you know a bit of a broad brush statement and um, and it's not you know what what's mining got to do with offshore wind but when you look at the uh, the disciplines within the the uh, Latrobe Valley uh, power generation sector such as engineering and the trades like electrical and, and mechanical and and boiler making and and um you know there's there's a multi operations there's a multitude of those jobs which are quite easily transferable to any um generation industry um it's just the fuel source that's changing um and um and for the better so i think um potentially there's 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 it's been floated roughly about 760 um, construction jobs for Star of the South um, within the within Gippsland, um, and possibly up to 200 ongoing long-term jobs once once the the project's up and running if it gets up to its full capacity. So so those jobs, um, while they may not be. Um, that, that, that they might may not be in the same numbers that the power industry currently um, employs. Um, surely some of those jobs remaining 
in Gippsland and 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 in the valley is is a positive thing rather than rather than us losing them to um, to the rest of the rest of the country where people will move looking for work once once the coal industry closes down. It's um, yeah, potentially for me it's it's not a not a huge issue. Um, I'm sort of looking down towards retirement and things like that. And and the coal workforce in the valley is, is largely an aging workforce. So a lot of the people there will uh, are kind of comfortable that there's enough work there to see them out. But it's it's about the emerging um, um, employment opportunities for our kids and our grandkids and and things like that. And and the potential loss of um, of um, economic benefit for the region. And and let's not forget we're not just talking direct jobs in in the um, the power generation. It's it's uh, you know, it's 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 all of the supply chain jobs that 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 go with these opportunities. And and if we could if we could manage to get some of the um, some of the manufacturing happening in in Latrobe Valley, which is it already has the social license for for heavy industry, uh, people are accepting of that. So there, there's not the um, the opposition to. Uh, you, know, you know, to setting up large industry and and things like that. In fact, people would welcome it. Um, just on Star of the South, the potential benefits um, of that uh, once again. Um, some of you have probably been out in Bass Strait, maybe fishing or trying to cross there, and would be well aware of um, how windy it can get out there. The, the potential of the wind strength out there um, to power potentially um, two thousand two hundred megawatts, I think, is the is the end game for Star of the South. And and um, one benefit of the wind in Bass Strait is that it's extremely strong um, on hot afternoons. When, when, when the largest demand um, for our electricity grid currently is. Um, so, and, and that's sort of, in a way, it's in inverse to the west of Victoria, the on, on land wind farms. Um, so when they drop off, the wind in Bass Strait normally picks up, which, so it's, it's, a, it's a really good balancing act for Victoria to, um, to look at the potential um, of that out there, we um, um, I, I quite often get asked, um, you know, I, I work in a coal-fired power station and I'm advocating for renewable energy and and stuff like that. It's a no-brainer to me, as I said before. The coal's the coal's shutting down, and um, and people often ask, well, what can we do to support? Um, support groups like the Latrobe Valley and the, and the workforce there. And, um, and I, I've got a, a three point sort of bit of a spiel that I, I quite often give to them. And it's uh, number one is stop demonizing coal communities because we've produced power like this for a hundred years. Um, and, and we're part of the reason that, that our economy, our economy and, the, and the, uh, we've been so successful to, to be able to, um, to progress uh, in society the way we have by producing electricity. Um, the second point is aimed at the coal community and that's to move away from coal graciously. Um, we need to accept the fact that it's closing down and there is opportunities that, that can take over from it. So, um, and, and the third point, which everybody um, obviously is, will be on board with is to advocate for government for, for policy. We need to know what's gonna replace it. We need to know, um, what we, how we can support um, the training and the transferable skills and, and things like that. So um, I'll leave it there um, and more than happy to answer any questions or expand on any of those, those points further. Thanks so much, Tony. That was, that was a really great presentation. Just really, really great to hear your local perspective um, coming from the Latrobe Valley and the power sector. And yeah, I think that, you know, I was hearing some, you know, some similarities um, in, in what you were talking about and what um, you Tully um, spoke about in terms of, you know, the transferable skill sets of, you know, 
of places like Newcastle and, and the Latrobe Valley, transferring those skills from the existing um, energy industries, um, whether that's coal or, or um, oil and gas, over into these new sectors like offshore wind, as well as the opportunity to, you know, develop that domestic manufacturing um, capability. Um, and, you know, we have um, been able to get, um, you know, alongside the, the unions and everyone has been pushing for um, the establishment of national offshore wind laws, which is just the first initial legislation to set up the industry. Um, you know, we've been able to win that, but there's a lot more to do in terms of creating, um, you know, proper industry plans and setting longer term targets to, to, to really make the most of this exciting new sector. So I think that, yeah, it was great to hear um, a little bit about how that could happen in the Latrobe Valley as well. So thanks so much, um, Tony. Um, we're now going to hear from, from Penny Howard, uh, who is a research officer at the Maritime Union of Australia. And uh, I'd say has probably been one of the, the most impactful um, advocates for um, offshore wind. Um, and it's been, you know, a joy of mine working alongside, campaigning alongside um, Penny and other, um, you know, people in the union movement the last couple of years. Um, so, um, yeah, if, in case you don't know, the, the Maritime Union um, represents dock workers, seafarers and workers in the coal export and offshore oil and gas industries, um, and you know, has, is also a support, supporter of action on climate change. Um, so it's, it's really great to have Penny here tonight to kind of give us a little bit of a, where have we come from? Where are we going in terms of offshore wind and you know, providing that union perspective as well. So um, over to you, Penny. You're just on mute, There Penny. we go. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, and thanks to everyone from Friends of the Earth uh, for, and the Climate Council for organizing this meeting and for all the work that, that you've done. Um, I think the, the work that you've done uh, through Yes to Renewables and Friends of the Earth in particular is a real model for um, the environment movement working with the, with the union movement. And it's um, a credit to yourselves um, and also to the membership um, of the union. We've got quite a few uh, MUA members um, on this um, on this meeting right now, include, including at least one, maybe a whole crew from a vessel that's uh, actually in the Bass Strait right now um, doing a, uh, a survey, towing cables out behind. So that's absolutely fantastic that you comrades um, have been able to, to join the meeting. Um, so you've already covered uh, who the MUA membership is. Um, and of course, uh, part of the MUA's history is um, also wanting to be um, at the forefront of the movements that have shaped um, Australia and made Australia a better place, that have fought for the rights um, that we need, that are you know standing up for the rights uh, that we haven't that we haven't achieved yet, um, and of course one of those critical issues that we're facing right now is how to address climate change. Um, of course, the question is how, with such an extraordinarily fraught political environment where the government uses every opportunity to try and uh, make the argument that climate action means a loss of jobs and with such a large portion of our membership working in offshore oil and gas and coal export ports uh, it's a challenge um, but it's one um, that we've at least taken some steps um, to getting to getting through and the reason that we've been able to get through that is by taking that forward-looking approach of what are the future jobs uh, that our members can do and how can we fight to ensure that those are going to be the best possible jobs um, that people will want to do and that they'll be able to enjoy the best possible uh, conditions uh, and union agreements in the course of doing those jobs. And by taking that approach, we've been able to, you know, take take some 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 sticky political uh, stances on things and, and have those discussions. Uh, and the membership have been very supportive of that and affirmed that position at a uh, national conference that we managed to have miraculously at the beginning of March in, um, in 2020. So it was great that we were able to do that and get the support from 400 delegates around the country from that approach. Um, we kicked it off and I'll uh, get the screen share going here. got two things.
It's just the green share screen button. Yeah, it's trying to grab two programs instead of one. So I might just need to adjust that one second. Okay. Let me just minimize that. All right. How's that? I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So in 2019, particularly with um, the Star of the South project, um, Danny Kane, so, who's one of... Sorry, Penny, I might just interrupt you. Yeah. Um, you might want to start the presentation because at the moment, it's... yeah, there we go. Great. Okay. <laughs> That's much better. Uh, where are we here? Excellent. Um, I'm in a funny screen here, but that's all right. Um, so in 2019, um, with the Star of the South project, um, Danny Kane, who is one of our officials working in the offshore oil and gas industry out of the West Australian branch, really um, started looking into this whole question of um, the potential for offshore wind in Australia and brought that to my attention. Um, so all credit, all credit to him for doing for, for, for doing that. And our interest in it has come out of a genuine interest in um, wanting to preserve the jobs in the future for our, our workers and members in that, in that industry. So we've had to think about what would it take to make the Star of the South project a genuine um, just transition. And we got together with some other unions and drafted um, a lot of claims about how do we maximize the number of jobs? How do we make those the best possible? How do we ensure um, the community benefits? And I think um, that document and um, the things that we've got in there still stands, although uh, the benefit we have now is that there's many more proposals now all, um, all, across, all across the country. Um, and we also wanted to be able to make that campaign as part of the climate movement as, as, as well. So um, we participated in a lot of the, of the climate strikes and, and, days, and days of action because we wanted to be able to show that we could do that we could be um, a union that represents workers in those industry that's fighting for the future um, of those people as as people as well and the fellow on the uh, on the left there is actually did this selfie from working on a uh, offshore gas project off the coast of um, uh, the northern territory off into off into west australia and by taking that approach by taking really seriously what the future jobs are a membership are going to be that's also allowed us to be able to take uh, political positions on issues uh, that are much harder and more challenging uh, because our membership understands um, that we are fighting uh, for their jobs and for their future. So some of those things which probably um, of interest to, to the audience here um, are new, uh, new South Wales branches um, oppose the uh, nearby gas uh, project. Um, we've formally put in a uh, a submission against the uh, Taylor's gas fired recovery, uh, basically just pointing out the hypocrisy of how he's spending hundreds of millions of dollars developing new gas basins um, and is basically refusing to spend anything on the development of genuinely innovative new technologies like offshore wind, in addition to wanting to fund uh, the construction um, of new new gas pipelines when he won't apply that same principle to, for example, long-term uh, power contracts. And most recently, the $90 billion uh, that, no, it's not even $90 billion, it's much more than $90 billion um, that will be spent on those, um, on those nuclear submarines. And of course, uh, we'd much prefer for that money to be spent on things that are of, um, of social benefit, including building the offshore wind projects and the infrastructure that's needed to support them as well. Um, so subsequently, the things that we've been working on um, within offshore wind um, over the past 2020, 2021, first of all, we got really seriously engaged in the integrated system plan process that's run by AEMO that plans out the future of the electricity system for Australia. And initially, this plan did not include any consideration of offshore wind. Um, but we were able to work with the ETU and with other people, including the Cl Climate Council. Um, and what they've done now is they've actually declared four separate offshore wind zones. And that just came out uh, in July. And those will now be formally included in the planning process uh, going forwards. And we'll be able to find out a bit more about how the projections for that process is going um, in early December. But looking at this map, you can see the significance of that because 
uh, particularly in New South Wales, um, all the current generation capacity is right around Newcastle. And what we are looking at is all of that being shut down and moved hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away. And by keeping the potential of offshore wind um, alive in Newcastle as well um, as off the Illawarra, what we can do is we can keep some of that energy generation and keep some of those jobs uh, in, that, in that region as well. Uh, what they also did is they split off the, um, they used to have the Gippsland REZ as an onshore and offshore one. They've now split that in half. And I think that allows them to kind of give a better reflection of what the different capacities are of the wind in that's onshore as well as uh, offshore as well. So that should assist uh, with the planning process. Um, the other thing that we got really involved with was a big um, research project. Um, scandalously, there'd been no, um, There'd been no general research done on the potential of offshore wind in Australia since 2009. Um, so that's quite atrocious. None of our national science agencies, renewable energy agencies, any of those things were doing it um, or funding it. Um, so the ETU, the MUA, the ACTU um, and the manufacturing union got together, put some money together and were able to get some funding from the Blue Economy Cooperative Research Funding Center, which is actually funded through uh, the uh, Federal Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. So we did manage to get some uh, government money for that as well. Um, and that's called the, the Blue Economy Potential for Offshore Wind in Australia project. Uh, if somebody wants to put the link to the chat That'd be great, but it gives a really good overview of what are the potential locations, what are the projects uh, that are currently uh, being proposed, and there's also a chapter in there on the on the jobs potential as well. But one of the really interesting things that it found out is this whole question of, and there was a question in the chat earlier about what's the contribution that offshore wind can make. Why would we want to have? We've got other renewable energy sources. What can this contribute? Um, in an electricity system sense, aside from all the uh, jobs and uh, employment benefits. And basically what this, what this diagram shows, you've got um, onshore wind in green, uh, solar in yellow, and offshore wind in blue. And where they, all three of them overlap, they're at all at their strongest, uh, over 50% um, output. But where none of those, um, none of those circles overlap, um, that means that only that one source of energy is operating at a high output. So you can see, just to give you an example uh, for Newcastle, 11% uh, of the year, so that's quite a number of hours of the year, um, you've got only offshore wind that's operating at high capacity, while you're not getting any solar power and you're not getting any um, onshore wind power. And the other forms of, uh, you know, solar, you do, you know, it's it's the concept of a renewable energy system where you've got to get all these different energy sources and knit the whole grid together and make the whole system work in what's a really interesting uh, challenge that we're going to have to face. Um, there's a similar, the, the, the circles for Gippsland look quite similar. I apologize, I just had a, a, new, a new South Wales slide here, but you really get that effect in Gippsland. And as Tony has um, already really well explained, but I've got the graphic here, you've got a meteorological phenomenon where um, high pressure systems in the Tasman Sea between southern New South Wales and um, New Zealand produce heat waves in Melbourne. But they also produce very strong winds uh, in, um, in, eastern, um, in eastern Victoria. And that's why you get that effect that Tony described where on heat wave days, on the highest uh, peak demand electricity days, you get really strong winds uh, exactly in the location where they want to build the Star of the South offshore wind farm. Now that has, research hasn't been done in New South Wales yet, or at least not publicly, possible some of these project proponents have, uh, have done that, uh, but we might see a similar effect in New South Wales, just looking at that little map there. And what that means is that that Star of the South project can make a really great contribution to peak electricity demand um, on those hot days and then also in the evening because um, it produces more uh, wind and electricity in the evening. Um, so that was a uh, yeah, really useful contribution um, of, that, of that project as well. Now, of course, we've got the, um, the legislation in Parliament. Uh, we've got, it uh, depends how you count them, 10, 15 projects, it seems every few weeks there's another new project announced lots of different 
developers. Um, we've got projects in West Australia, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, uh, and possibly Queensland as well. Um, now, looking at the legislation, it's very conflicted, right? So on the one hand, you've got a piece of legislation that basically just says, if a private company wants to build an offshore wind farm, go ahead, let them build an offshore wind farm. It's not our business to support them. It's not our business to encourage them, um, but we will be spending hundreds of millions of dollars on doing that for um, gas pipelines and opening up new gas basins. So on the one hand, that's really frustrating. On the other hand, we actually do need this legislation to be passed um, as quickly as possible. Um, there's a danger that if um, it gets delayed too long, it can get caught up in the next election cycle and we'll end up you know, halfway through 2022 still without any possibility um, for these projects to be able to take their first um, step. So what we've, what our strategy has been is basically to try and look at what are some key things that we can improve um, out of this bill and how can we use that Senate inquiry that's just been on to try and map out a future of what would we actually, how do we actually want this industry developed um, by a future government that might uh, have its priorities a little bit straighter. So the key things that we're focusing on now is one, um, they have introduced the national WHS system for offshore, um, but they've switched off all different parts of it. So it's turned into quite a, um, a muddled, <laughs> a muddled um, um, system. So we want to try and keep that as consistent as possible with the onshore WHS system. And particularly a lot of the things they've switched off are places where workers have got rights where unions have got rights as well. And that's because they've tried to back engineer the WHS legislation to match more closely to the uh, work health and safety legislation for the offshore oil and gas industry, uh, where workers have got much fewer rights than, than workers onshore. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is the first step um, is the declaration of an offshore electricity area, uh, which the minister does. But there's nothing in the legislation that allows someone else to ask the minister to do that and for the minister to do that on a timeline. So basically said, listen, we should be able to have electricity planning agencies, state governments or proponents to ask the minister, can you declare an area and give him a timeline on when he has to do that? Because uh, knowing Angus Taylor, uh, we don't want to leave that process entirely in his hands and at his discretion. Um, and the third thing is there's nothing in the legislation that requires um, an assessment of the future jobs, of local manufacturing, of community benefit, of First Nations benefit when licenses are being held, uh, handed out to companies. Uh, so we're saying that that needs to be added at least in a cursory headline sense uh, to the criteria for awarding licenses. And there is also a provision in there for companies to bid against each other for licenses, just who can pay more cash. And we just want that to be deleted entirely. We want projects to be decided on their merits. Best, best project uh, gets the license and companies should be competing to provide uh, the best possible project. So hopefully that will get passed. Um, there'll be all sorts of regulations to follow up from that. But of course, one of the key things to follow up from that point is ensuring um, that we get the jobs results that we need and that these projects can all move, move ahead um, and that we can yeah, get the jobs outcomes and also get the emissions reductions we need out of the energy system um, and that we can get um, the rights for workers like Tony and his younger colleagues to transition over to these, to these projects um, and ensure that they've still got you know, good pay, good union agreements um, to, um, for their working life there. So anyway, I'll wrap it up and thanks very much again. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Penny. That was, you know, very comprehensive, um, you know, looking at lots of different issues in the energy system and, and the role that, you know, offshore wind could potentially play. And, you know, some of the sort of complex policy and politics that the unions have had to, you know, kind of navigate the last few years to, to try and get progress on the issue. Um, you mentioned legislation. Um, you know, many people in in the room might be familiar with the the national the need for national offshore wind legislation. But in case you haven't haven't um, you know heard of this, you know, basically the industry has you know has not been legally permitted to exist. Um, so you know, with proposals like the Star of the South, 
and others, um, uh, you know, they, they can't legally proceed for, through a planning system without uh, legislation in place to initiate the industry in Commonwealth waters. And so that's that's really why this this um, this legislation is very necessary. But as Penny said, there are these like serious issues, um, you know, that we'd like to address um, uh, in the legislation as well. So there's, there's a bit to do. Uh, and we'll hear more a little bit more about um, about the opportunities uh, on that front shortly. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, Penny, um, for the presentation. Uh, I've put a few of the links in the chat um, to some of those reports, so um, check those out if you if you are interested. Um, is is Tom Quinn in the room? I think yes, I, I think I, ma got... I made it back, Pat. So yes, I'm okay, <laughs> great. So um, we're now going to. Tom is going to be our, our final speaker for the evening. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, so Tom is the, um, the head of policy and research at the climate um, think tank Beyond Zero Emissions. Um, his career has focused on addressing the complex challenge of climate change through um, policy interventions in energy, law and economics. Um, this has included commissioning the seminal Fiduciary Duties and Climate Change Legal Opinion, helping establish the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project and producing uh, reports such as The Next Boom to demonstrate the economic upside of rapidly um, decarbonising the economy. So Tom's current work at Beyond Zero Emissions is focused on decarbonising heavy industry and making Australia a clean export powerhouse. So, um, really looking forward to hearing from from Tom and give and um, you know hearing your expert opinion on on the opportunities and offshore wind. So, thank you, Tom. Leave it to you. Thanks, Pat, and thank you all for for attending tonight. Like this is a very important discussion um, and one that we think has got a huge amount of opportunity for Australia. Uh, Look, I guess, I guess the headline message before I get into a bit more of the substance is like we view offshore wind, meaning off, onshore jobs. It's a huge opportunity with a lot of flow and benefits across a number of areas of Australia. Um, but before we get into the offshore wind side of things, I will set the context with the work that Beyond Zero Emissions is doing with our renewable energy industrial precincts work. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Million Jobs Plan that we released last, which basically showed how we could create an economic comeback by focusing on um, you know, a, a, green, a green recovery as opposed to a gas recovery or other, other types that are out there. Um, now, a core part of this was looking at our regional centres um, and the potential for us to create a regional jobs boom um, and really set our regions up for a strong and diverse economic future. Um, by really leaning into the future trends. So looking at um, how do we both decarbonise existing industry, whether that's our aluminium smelters, our, our steel mills, um, as well as all the SMEs that support them, as well as building the industries that will supply the clean commodities of the future, such as green hydrogen, um, all the critical minerals that we need in, um, lithium, um, in, in batteries, um, uh, wind turbines and the rest. Um, and... Through that work, we identified 14 locations across Australia that were ideal, and ideal for a few key reasons. Um, one is that they're existing industrial centres, so it means they've got a highly skilled industrial workforce and highly skilled industrial capabilities to be able to do the heavy industry type of thing that we need to build a clean commodity base. Um, two, they've got exceptional access to renewable energy resources, typically renewable energy zones, because we can't have a clean commodity base without plugging out industry areas into these you know, um, high density um, renewable energy areas. Um, and three is having really good um, port access, ideally port access, but also you know, um, road and rail access, because you know, it, it's not much use having a great industrial center if you can't get the products to market. Um, now we've been doing a lot of work, particularly in two locations in Gladstra and the Hunter. Um, we've got people on the ground there to really, I guess, go deep and understand um, both what the opportunity is as well as the barriers. So we work extensively with industry, with community, with the union groups. Um, and recently we commissioned a report looking at the, the economic upside for just these two locations. And really the results blew us away. It showed in these two locations alone, you create 45,000 new jobs. $13 billion of additional revenue by 2032, if we position them as the first renewable energy industrial precincts. 
Now, this starts to get to why we're very interested in offshore wind, because the follow-on work that we've been doing in Gladstone has been looking at, well, how much energy do we need to really power these heavy industry areas? And, you know, most of these locations, that they, they consume huge amounts. Like, you know, Gladstone and the Hunter, they've got two of our four aluminium smelters. Aluminium smelters generally consume between 10 to 14% of the state's entire energy. Like, they are phenomenally hungry. They are really, really energy-hungry beasts. Um, and when you start to add on other industries too, such as green hydrogen, you start to talk about real amounts of energy that's going to be required. So for Gladstone alone, and look, these are just our in-house numbers at the moment. We don't, we haven't published it, but it's showing that for the Gladstone region, you'd probably need about 24 gigawatts of new renewable energy capacity. Now that is a lot. It's a really, really big amount. It's almost half the current capacity of the entire national energy market on the East Coast. So you know, it, it's a lot, and that's for one location. But to be honest, that's what you kind of expect if we are going to grow um, and build these sectors to their full potential. And that's why offshore wind is really important um, because, you know, uh, Penny's given us a very thorough run through of a lot of that. So I won't go over that territory um, too much. But for us to power these renewable energy industrial precincts adequately, you need that nice spread of generation. And we've seen that with offshore wind, it really complements nicely onshore wind and onshore solar. And if you get that nice generation spread, the thing that allows you to do is require less storage. And that matters because storage is still very expensive. So you get a much better um, energy economy by getting that spread. You get a much more reliable power source and you save a lot of money that you'd otherwise be putting into pumped hydro and, and chemical battery storage. So, so that, that matters. Um, the other thing too, and this, this just applies more broadly is Having offshore wind allows us to get that scale of build out in renewables that we need. And, you know, let's face it, we are in a race against time. We need to decarbonise our grid as quickly as possible. Every bit of emissions reduction we achieve today is far, we're far more than emissions reductions in 20, 30 years time. So the sooner we can get an offshore wind sector um, going, the sooner we can both diversify our regions' economies and the sooner we can get onto a pathway to a much safer climate, which will then have you know, benefits across the board. Um, so that's the first reason, you know, offshore wind is really good for that generation capacity to get both that spread of generation um, as well as that build out required to power our renewable energy industrial precincts and communities more generally. The second reason, which has also been touched on, so I won't go too much into it, um, but these renewable energy, energy industrial precincts, sorry, I'm going to stumble over my words <laughs> saying this too much, um, but because they're heavy industry centres, they've already got excellent transmission linkages. Like, you know, if you're looking at La Trobe Valley or Newcastle, Gladstone, they have very, very, like pretty much the most heavy duty energy infrastructure we've got anywhere in the country. So rather than building it from scratch in new locations, it makes a lot of sense to be able to plug in. And as, you know, just by chance, by and large, we've got exceptional wind resources near transmission infrastructure. So we can essentially plug it straight in. Now that matters because a lot of the build out of other renewable energy zones at the moment is being hamstrung by transmission infrastructure because, you know, let's say if we take somewhere like Victoria, in the east is where the Trove Valley is located. It's where all the heavy transmission lines are, but most of the onshore winds, wind resources are in the west. And so you've got much skinnier electrical lines. If we can plug into the existing stuff, it just saves overall costs and makes us much more, um, a, a much easier transition for us to achieve. Um, and the final part is, if you've got a strong offshore wind sector, it also helps diversify those regional economies. It helps get that regional growth. You know, the, the rough rule of thumb, Penny, you probably know this better than me in the blue um, CRC report, is that for every one offshore job, you can create eight onshore jobs through the, the construction like um, of the turbines themselves. Like you know, offshore turbines require a lot of steel, um, fabricated steel, they require a lot of concrete or you know, pylons and or other sorts of things, depending on how you're anchoring them or floating them. Um, you know, it makes sense to produce them locally, so you're reducing your transport costs. So, you know, regional centres can become the hubs that produce the materials um, and manufacturing components that go into the offshore wind sector. Um, the other potential bit is they start to become service centres, and this is particularly an opportunity for the likes of, um, you know, areas like Newcastle, um, you know, Depending on where you're looking at offshore wind, you're either going to embed them onto the seafloor or you're going to have them floating. Now, floating is still new, but it's coming down the cost curve. Um, if you've got floating, it's really good for deep water, like off the coast of Newcastle. 
And for servicing them, you won't be going out there on a boat. You'd probably actually tow the wind turbine into shore for servicing. You know, somewhere like the Port of Newcastle could become an exceptional service centre for the offshore wind um, industry. So I guess to tie a bow on it, you know, offshore wind means onshore jobs. It's a huge opportunity. It helps us get that generation potential that we need to decarbonise the entire grid. Um, it makes sense of using our existing infrastructure and it can also turbocharge growth and economic diversification in our regional centres. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tom. That was, you know, it's just really interesting to hear, I guess, like this, the scale of the, the change that is that is underway and, you know, what, you know, a technology like offshore wind can, can do and the role that it can play in decarbonising not just electricity, but, you know, also manufacturing and, um, you know, the production of renewable hydrogen and all of these other new industries that are, are going to be necessary for the, the deeper, longer term decarbonisation of, of the economy. So, yeah, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, now, I think that it's, we, we said we'd run to about 7.30. So we've got, we've got a short um, period of time for some, some questions and answers um, from the crowd. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the, um, the presentations. Um, so I might just open it up to the floor um, for some questions. Uh, I believe Jason got in early uh, with some questions. Uh, so I might just um, jump to, to Jason's, Jason Ray's question to um, the Lord Mayor. Um, so Jason is asking, do you know how much of New South Wales energy um, the proposed Newcastle offshore wind projects could provide um, and or what the jobs or energy output would be compared with um, the Curry Curry gas plant. Um, I might, um, and fit other panellists, feel free to jump into it. Yeah, that yeah sure. Yeah. I think some of those were answered earlier, earlier in the chat. I think the presentation, um, I also included the stat around uh, it, almost all of New South Wales uh, energy could be supplied. Um, through the offshore wind, so just not Victoria, obviously, New South Wales. And just going to the point that Tom made at the end there, part of uh, the viability of these projects is the grid network that exists onshore very close to where you could potentially have that deep water um, is uh, one of the most significant um, large transmission sites in the country. So there's a couple of those benefits. Uh, the I think the people, in, like if everyone's reading the chat, they've covered off the very small amount of jobs um, that are that would come out of gas, uh, fired plants. And from uh, my understanding of what's been printed in the local media, uh, the uh, hours of operation or the percentage time of operation are exceptionally low uh, in in terms of you know looking at that sort of fossil fuel um, and the investment that. Uh, unfortunately, it's already been announced, and that's why the import, I, that's why I ma deliberately wanted to make time this evening because these important conversations need to be had uh, through all our local communities and really need to land at the door of some of the decision makers, particularly federally. But you know, you can always hold out hope. There's been such a dearth of leadership for so long on anything to do with uh, climate policy. Uh, that's why local government and other levels of government have been injecting themselves into this discussion. And I'm hoping that the consortia tonight, and I just have to reiterate the leadership that um, the MUA have shown together with the ETU. And when you look at the opportunity for manufacturing onshore, that it's not just energy production. These are whole uh, industries, uh, secondary uh, industries uh, that are exceptionally good for the, for the country. Fantastic. Um, Thank you. Oh, I can, I can jump in there. Yeah. So what's I've looked at the the planning document. There's going to be ten permanent jobs out of Curry Curry, a few hundred construction jobs. Although the peak there of a few hundred construction jobs would be only for a few a few months. It's a completely different proposition because the Curry Curry 
plant, the concept is, is that it um, turns on for a short period of time to fill in gaps and is extremely expensive to run. They're actually going to start by running it on diesel, which like no one does unless they're, you know, on an oil rig or a deserted island um, or there's a blackout. <laughs> That's why we have an electricity system. You don't need to use diesel. Um, um, at versus offshore wind are very large, very consistent source of power um, where one project would potentially provide about 300 um, ongoing jobs. And of course, we've got the government that's spending $600 million on the Curry Curry plant um, and is not willing to spend money um, on developing an offshore and supporting the development of an offshore wind industry. And Pe Penny also, I think both, everyone has touched on the... Uh, the, the time of construction is over so many years that, that there's 10,000 jobs in the construction and that goes potentially over decades. So the, the volume of jobs that could be created um, just allowing this industry and supporting this industry to operate uh, in and itself is an economic achievement for the country, let alone the net uh, benefit to the climate. So you know, that's why I think we're all there here this evening. So uh, I would even suggest that these are early modelling numbers in terms of ongoing jobs. If you included the stats that Tom mentioned around uh, uh, one job and then eight uh, down the line, there's so, there's so much opportunity here. Yeah, that's right. I think that, you know, we, we've heard, you know, many, many different reports about the... Um, you know, I guess the different multiplying effects of like um, the job creation, um, both offshore wind and other associated industries. Um, I think I'm just going to go to a couple more questions in the, that are coming up in the chat. Um, so there's one here from Simon uh, on, you know, thoughts on um, the hydrogen um, industry uh, and and what some people call blue hydrogen, which is uh, um, you know, uh, a term used by the, the, the gas industry as opposed to green hydrogen or renewable um, pr um, hydrogen produced from renewable energy. Would any of the panellists like to comment on that? I might as well front up for that one, Pat. <laughs> look, it's a good one. And look, I guess BZD, we deal a lot with the investor community, with industry, and the overwhelming view of everyone who's seriously looking to invest in this, it's green hydrogen or nothing, you know. If you're looking at blue hydrogen, it's a technological dead end. You're looking at steam methane refracting technology, which is completely different from electrolysis as a pathway. Um, you know, the general sentiment among investors is why would we invest in blue hydrogen? It's still carbon intensive. We're pretty skeptical at CCS. If we're doing that, we might as well just do fossil gas. If we're going to go to hydrogen, the only pathway is green hydrogen. And it makes a lot of sense. You know, you know this is what investors want. It's what our international trading partners want. We might as well lean into the trend towards a fully decarbonised fuel system, both liquid fuel and um, electrons, um, rather than trying to chase the industries of the past. So that, I think that's a quick summary. Um, but I would say one of the interesting things on the hydrogen front, and this is what we're doing a lot of work in, is, um, you know, as soon as we start to look at a great... Sorry. Because someone... That's all right. Um, I was going to say, um, one of the things that we're looking at, that it makes a lot of sense... Um, as much as possible to use green hydrogen onshore. Um, as soon as you're exporting hydrogen, it's pretty expensive. And if we can use it onshore, it also means we're using it for value adding, which means we're, we're boosting the local economy. But that's a bigger discussion, which we can explore another time. Uh, and, and the question of scale that Tom mentioned before with Gladstone is exactly the same. You know, if you look at the hydrogen that you need to, for example, run the Port Kembla Steelworks and turn it into you know, a green steel manufacturing, you need a vast quantity of hydrogen. And the only way you're going to get enough electricity to do that is by having a big offshore wind farm there. There's just not the capacity there to build that kind of electricity source on shore. But there, there is enough capacity. There's plenty of room. We did the numbers as part of that report um, as well. There's, you know, huge amounts of energy that can be produced in that way. Right. Uh, in in Newcastle, oh, did you want me to tell you about the one in Newcastle? Or people might already know. There's a, a there's a consortia um, of quite large players in the energy uh, 
market that have actually already made an announcement about a, a couple, a three phase plan around um, hydrogen. Um, they're calling it the, the Hunter Hydrogen Network. Uh, and that's a partnership with AGL, uh, APA Group and ITM Power. So they're looking at the first stage, which would run up until 2024, um, and that's looking at the installation of electrolyzers at uh, critical phases. And they're doing that up in the valley at Musselbrook, um, where they're closing uh, down uh, uh, coal-fired power stations at Liddell and the like. And that um, H2N network, the, there's that first phase um, and a pipeline would go from Musselbrook to Liddell uh, and associated infrastructure for the hydrogen fuels and um, mining green chemicals. The next stage um, looks at a cluster developed at Musselbrook and that's, another, and that's the one at the AGL owned site. And the third stage um, of that plan that they've got around hydrogen is around uh, the export uh, and a facility at the port. So that's just to give everyone an update on where that hydrogen cluster is here. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Nuatali. Um, I'm just going to um, take a look at the the comments. I think we've also had a question just around, you know, like um, what are the next steps? Um, so, you know, in I can speak a little bit about what we're doing at Friends of the Earth, and other organisations might like to chime in in in, in you know some of your upcoming act activities. But um, so the the legislation that we've all been fighting for to, to, to come into Parliament. It's in Parliament, it's in the, it's sitting before this Senate inquiry. And so, um, you know, like a number of, um, I expect that, you know, the unions and some other climate groups ourselves will be presenting, um, I believe it's on Friday, the, the 1st of October. And so one of the things that, um, that we're keen to do at FOE is to um, you know, get people um, involved on, on social media and engaging with the issue. And so what we, um, I'm just trying to find the link here. We'd just like to invite people to, to join um, the, the Twitter team for the Yes to Renewables campaign, which is a really powerful way to, to engage with the issue um, and make sure that you can, um, you know, make your voice heard and engage directly, um, you know, with decision makers. Uh, so I'll share a link to that in a moment. Um, and, you know, like we've heard, heard tonight a number of different issues around, um, you know, like we've got this legislation, it's not enough. We need to keep building um, the campaign and to push into to new ground. So that's something that we're going to be continuing to work on, um, whether that's pushing for, you know, an offshore wind industry plan, um, pushing to um, have greater ambition um, for offshore wind comparable to the US and UK where they're, they're setting ambitious targets for the sector. So that's something we're going to be continuing to campaign on um, in the future. And so one way that you can get involved is to join regular campaign collective meetings. And so um, for Yes to Renewables, we usually hold these uh, on Tuesdays and we're just in the phase of kind of getting, getting the campaign collective back up back up and running. So we're really keen for people to join the group and take on voluntary roles, whether that's research, um, social media work, um, lobbying, you know, like this is a community campaign and, you know, it's it, we can have greater impact when people um, lend a hand. So we'll share the um, details of that in the chat, um, but that, that will take place. We'll have a meeting next Tuesday, um, which I believe is the... I think I've set it up for the 5th of October, not next Tuesday, but I'll make sure that the, the right dates are available there on the, um, on the event pages. So that's just two really simple ways that you can, that you can get involved. Um, and the other, the other thing that's coming up from Friends of the Earth is a day of action um, for, um, for action on climate change, which is by a different campaign collective, the Act on Climate Team. Uh, so that's on the 1st of October. Um, so that's, that's going to involve, you know, taking, taking photos for social media and, um, you know, sending messages to federal um, politicians. So uh, I'll post a link to the chat um, so that everyone can um, join the opportunity there as well. Um, but maybe I'll just hand it over to um, some of the other um, panellists um, who might um, have events or anything else coming up um, to get involved in as well.
Unfortunately, I don't have any events to advertise. We've just been kind of flat out keeping up with um, with what's with what's happening. Um, I did want to make a couple a couple more comments. There was a, a question in the chat about the estimates of the future size of the industry. The thing that's really hard to get your head around is that there's literally no planning that's happened. So, for example, as part of that blue economy union report. Um, we've estimated there's a capacity, technically available capacity, close to grid, right depth of water, all that of 2000, just over 2000 gigawatts. Uh, we've got that and we've got private companies proposing projects. And so when people talk about projects under development, it's literally projects that have just are just being proposed by, you know, a, an assortment of different um, investors. Some of them are very serious. We have no idea if all of them are very serious. I know for a fact one of them does not actually have anyone in their company currently inside Australia. Um, so it's really hard to know <laughs> what that's actually going to mean um, for for the future and uh, the future of those of those projects. Um, so we really need an, some actual real planning here about what our future electricity system is going to look like, particularly considering the kinds of developments that Tom outlined, where we will need significantly more electricity to really tackle the challenges of decarbonization um, head on. Um, there were two other questions in the chat, one about the role of NOPSEMA, the offshore oil and gas regulator. Yes, they are very happily charging ahead with wanting the responsibility for this new industry. Um, they're about the most enthusiastic people in government about it. Um, that means they also want to recreate it in the image of the oil and gas industry. So there's some contradictions there. Um, particularly because, as I mentioned, there's much worse um, workplace health and safety law in the oil and gas industry. Um, and there was also a question in the chat about, about ownership. I mean, ultimately, best case scenario, we would have a massive emergency investment on the scale of the nuclear submarines to build the renewable energy infrastructure that we need and to build it now. Um, and unfortunately, that's not um, the political and, and to ensure the transition issues are addressed. Um, unfortunately, that's not what this current government has got on the table. It's probably not what um, a future government would have on the table either. Um, but you could have publicly, it's it difficult to offshore wind, the investments are so large that community ownership is really challenging, but you could actually have public ownership. You could have Snowy Hydro uh, not spending the $600 million on the Curry Curry plant, but spending, you know, making a significant investment um, in getting the offshore wind industry going by, you know, getting some initial projects um, off the ground um, that's entirely owned by um, by the government and could keep some of those profits and, you know, ensure we've got the industry set up properly with the right kinds of environmental conditions, the right kinds of jobs, all of that, all of that stuff as well. But unfortunately, um, that's not where we're at. So that just means we're all going to have to um, campaign as much as we can to ensure that the projects that are being proposed um, are rolled out in the in the best possible way. Yeah, thanks, Penny. Yeah, I think that's a really good, important point that, you know, we are dealing with um, you know, a, a federal government that is um, opposed to taking action on climate change. We've got, you know, they've been dragged kicking and screaming to deliver you know, this first, very first step to establish this, this sector, and we're going to need to keep, to keep pushing. Um, you know, there was another question in the chat from Bernie around, you know, the, what's the local content for some of um, these projects? Will they be getting, um, you know, their components from domestic manufacturing? And, you know, currently we, Australia doesn't really have the capabilities, um, at least in tower, like say tower manufacturing, maybe just in steel fabrication, it's a different story, but we don't currently have the capabilities to manufacture um, offshore wind towers or maybe only certain sections of them. But that's that's an issue that is going to require governments to actually plan for the future. And, you know, that's the sort of thing where we need to see, um, you know, industry plans, local content requirements, so that we're actually maximising the local job creation and something that, you know, we're going to be continuing to campaign on. So, um, yeah, just really reiterating that, you know, if, if these are issues for you, um, then, then get involved in the campaign and, you know, we're going to be able to take action together and, and, and hopefully create a, create a bit more progress on that front. Um, I'm just going to pass the mic to my colleague, Wendy Farmer, uh, who is from the Latrobe Valley. Um, and Wendy just wanted to uh, have, have um, a few, added extra, some extra words to the event. So, um, Wendy, over to you. 
Thanks, Pat, and thanks to all those wonderful speakers. So much information there. It was amazing. Um, I just wanted to let people, especially from the Gippsland area, know that I am working across the Gippsland area for Yes to Renewables, and I'd really love you to reach out and see how we can work together to actually make sure that we're not left behind in the transition that is happening. You know, we we don't have a choice whether it happens, it will happen. Um, so let's not be left out. Let's reach out together and work together. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Wendy. And I've just put Wendy's email in, in the chat. So if, you, if you're from the region, you want to get in touch, um, that's probably the easiest way to get, get in touch with, with Wendy. Um, okay, I'm just... Um, just having a quick look through if, if we've got any last um, questions. Um, we are at just past time and, um, you know, a good sharp, sh short sharp event is, 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 the best, is the best one. Um, so I think I might wrap, wrap things up soon. Um, but just wanted to leave it to the panellists if you wanted to each, you know, if you have any final comments that you'd like to make um, before we, we wrap things up. Oh, look, I'll just say, look, once again, a big thank you to everyone. It's great to see this amount of interest in offshore wind. It's a totally new sector and it's going to be so important. Um, I guess I'll just give the, everyone the heads up. We'll be releasing a major report next week looking at how Australia can pivot our export industry into these clean commodities. It's a very big one and very exciting. We hope it helps change the conversation and offshore wind is going to be key to powering it. I just want to say uh, thanks for having me this evening. I look forward to continuing the work, um, not just in Newcastle and the Hunter, but the advocacy statewide and nationally uh, for um, stronger zero emission targets. And uh, we in local government, I actually chair the steering committee of the Global Covenant of Mayors for the whole Oceania region. And we will actually, in terms of doing events, um, I think we're looking at an October date with all the lockdown, it's difficult to try and um, uh, really unite local government across Oceania. So that's PNG, the Pacific and the like in advocacy leading up to COP26. So I might let you know when I have a date and you can distribute it in your networks. It's obviously a bit broader than offshore wind, but it's really looking at making sure we're holding the federal government to account um, when and if they uh, represent us at COP26. Great, thanks, Yuvatali. Um, do any others on the panel, Penny or Tony, would you like to say any last, make any last comments? No, look, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, talk to everybody and to, to share a bit of a perspective from um, a community that's that's already entered transition and um, with with not much direction, unfortunately. So we we need um, we need support. We need uh, policy from from government to to shore up where we're heading, and 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 and, and the community will jump on board one hundred percent when we've got that goal. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Great. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, Penny, any last words or <laughs> shaking your head, smiling? <laughs> Thank you. I've gone on for plenty. Okay, great. Well, yeah, thank, I just want to thank all of um, our speakers for, for joining us tonight. It's been a really interesting discussion, um, just hearing the experiences um, throughout, you know, all across the country um, and, you know, different communities um, about the opportunities in offshore wind. It's a really exciting time. Um, we've, you know, working across the climate and union movement, we've been able to, you know, help get progress on some important laws, but there is more work to do. And I think if we, you know, if we keep combining our efforts and, and working together, I'm sure that we can, um, you know, achieve even more. So I'm just really excited to, um, for everyone to just keep backing each other up. Um, there were some questions around some of the resources that were offered in the chat. So I just want to let everyone know that the event has been recorded and we'll be sharing the recording um, of the event um, with all the participants. And I'll, I'll put together a little bit of a summary of the resources too that people can use. Um, but yeah, thanks so much to everyone who um, has joined the call tonight, you know, adding your questions and 
and listening in. Um, thank you to the Climate Council as well, who um, co-hosted the event and has helped with some of the, the promotion. Um, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, let's just keep working together and see, see what more we can do when it comes to offshore wind and action on climate change. But uh, let's leave it there. Thank you and good evening. Thank you.